We are teaching through the Gospel of John over a four-month period, and this weekend and next weekend, we come to our conclusion in the Gospel of John. Today, we're going to be in John chapter 20. We'll be at the end of the chapter, and it, it really is the uh, concluding thoughts regarding the Gospel of John, and then next week, we en- enter into some bonus content. And so if you have a Bible, I want to challenge you to take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, come to the altar room after the gathering. We will we'll get you a Bible. We want to make sure everyone has a copy of God's Word. We've actually been reading through the Bible together as a church family. And if that's something that would interest you on a day-by-day basis, you can follow along with where we are reading through the Bible. On my Instagram page, I'm posting comments about every chapter that I read in my Bible this calendar year, and we've, we've made our way well, quite a bit through the Bible this year. So if, if that's something that would be of helpful to you as a resource, you can just go to my Instagram page. My name is Joel Boone, and you can find every day as I'm posting those comments, if that would be a resource that would help you. The text that we're in today is John chapter 20, verse 19 through 31. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, even so. I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his sign, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come together to gather for worship. God, I pray your protection over this church family. God, would you guide us and would you lead us? Would you protect us? Would your hand be a covering over us as a church body? Lord, from the youngest person in our church to the oldest person in our church, God, would you protect us? Protect us from the attack of the enemy. Protect us from the the works of the enemy. And Lord, that we might be able to live in your covering and to trust that you have us in your hand. Lord, that you will lead and guide and protect our lives. Lord, as we spend time in the word, God, whatever it is that's going on in our life right now, would your word intersect with our lives? And Lord, would we come to know you, God, as active right in the very place we are? Lord, for the person that is new here today, God, I pray that they might discover a God who loves them and a word of God that is powerful for their life, And would the Holy Spirit of God do a work of drawing them to you? And so, God, we are your people and we are here for your glory. So would you be glorified in us? And we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's family said, amen, amen. In the Gospel of John, in the last two chapters, the way that the Gospel concludes is with three times that Jesus appears to a group of disciples. The text that we're reading today has two of those times where Jesus appears to the group of disciples. And one of the things that's very clear 
is the situation that those disciples are in when Jesus appears to them the first time. And that is they are very afraid. They're very afraid. Their leader was just crucified on a cross and buried in a tomb. And they are full of fear and they're in a room with the doors locked. And one of the things I think it helps us to understand is like we see that these grown men in the middle of their vocations are in a room with the doors locked and they're afraid. They're going to have an encounter with Jesus. They don't know it yet. But what are the places in our own life where we're experiencing fear? How can we understand where we're experiencing fear so that as we go through this passage, we can consider where we're experiencing fear and how Jesus might want to show up in a way maybe we don't understand yet to the place of fear we're experiencing. Are we experiencing fear in our health or maybe the health of a loved one? Are we experiencing fear regarding a relationship, a relationship that is broken? Are we experiencing fear because of our finances and we're not sure how we're going to make it? Are we experiencing fear in our workplace or in our vocation? Are we experiencing fear in our mind because of something that happened long ago or because we're stuck in where we are now or because we're so worried about what's coming? Wherever it is that we're experiencing fear, I want to challenge you to consider that in light of what we're going to see in this text. Where are we experiencing fear? The text begins on the evening of that day, and it's referring to the day Jesus rose from the grave. So this is Easter number one. This is resurrection day number one. On the evening of that first resurrection day, the first day of the week, John helps us understand it's Sunday. So this is the very first resurrection Sunday evening. The doors being locked. They're in a house, they're in a room, and it's locked up. And the disciples are there. The disciples of Jesus are there, and they're gathered in a room, a house that has the doors locked. Why? For fear of the Jews. They are afraid of the religious Jewish leaders who just led a process where they took their leader, Jesus, through trials and through torture, and then handed him over to the Roman government. And the Roman government, through trial and torture, put Jesus on a cross, and Jesus was crucified and died on a cross. And they are now together in a room, locked. And they have fear of what the Jews might do. Jesus had already appeared to Mary. Jesus had already appeared to the women. Jesus had already appeared to guys on the road. They had already seen an empty tomb, but all of this is not clicking yet with the disciples. And here they are huddled up and they're afraid. And Jesus came and stood among them. He miraculously shows up in the room and he says to them, peace be with you. The very first words that come out of Jesus' mouth to a group of men who are huddled up afraid is, peace be with you. And one of the questions that I think we need to ask is, where are the places of fear we're experiencing? And what would happen if Jesus showed up in our life in the very place where we're afraid and he spoke peace into it? In the Gospel of John, there are six times where the word fear or feared shows up in the Gospel of John. Only six places the word fear is used in the Gospel of John. The first is when Jesus goes up to the feast, he starts going to feast, and no one wants to talk openly about Jesus at the feast because it says they are afraid because they have fear of the Jews. The next place it shows up is in chapter 9, and Jesus heals a man who was born blind and the authorities get involved and they want to start questioning the man and they start questioning the man's parents and they're asking the man's parents questions and the man's parents say, well, why don't you just go ask him? He's an adult. You go ask him what happened in his life. And it says they said these things because they feared the Jews. 
For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess that Jesus is the Christ, that he would be put out of the synagogue. So here we got some parents of a grown man, and they're afraid to even say anything about their grown man who just was healed by Jesus because they're afraid of the Jews kicking them out of the local synagogue. In chapter 12, there's a prophecy that's pulled into the gospel of John from the book of Zechariah, and it speaks over the whole city. It says, fear not, O daughter of Zion. Zion is the name that King David gave for Jerusalem. And so it speaks to the whole city that's in fear. Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. In chapter 12, where the gospel of John really swings from covering a a timeline of years to a timeline of days, it says that even the authorities believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they didn't confess it because they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. After Jesus is crucified and he dies on the cross, there's a man named Joseph of Arimathea and he goes to Pilate. He's a secret disciple. And it says that he was a secret disciple because he was afraid of the Jews. And he goes to Pilate and he asks, can I have the body? Can I take the body of Jesus down from the cross? And can I have the body to prepare it for burial? And then the sixth time fear is mentioned is this passage right here. The disciples are huddled up. It's the very first resurrection Sunday evening. And it says on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Six times. Fear is mentioned in the gospel of John. It's all related to the tension of who's in charge and who is the authority and who's going to get punishment and who's going to get hurt. And I think the question that we have to ask when Jesus shows up and says, peace be with you, is this. Is the peace of Jesus sufficient for all of our fears? Was it enough That those disciples there who were huddled up and they were afraid, was it enough that Jesus showed up and said to them, peace be with you? Is the peace of Jesus sufficient for those disciples? When we're experiencing fear regarding our health or our loved one, is the peace of Jesus sufficient for our fears regarding health? What about our fears regarding our relationships that are broken? Is the peace of Jesus sufficient? If he were to speak peace into our lives, would it be sufficient for those places where our relationships are broken? What about our fears regarding our finances and whether we're going to be able to make it to the end of the month? Is the peace of Jesus going to be sufficient to speak into our finances? What about in the places in our mind where we cannot get out of the past in our thinking or we are stuck right now or we are so worried about what's coming? If Jesus were to speak his peace into our heart and our mind, would it be sufficient for everything that we fear? In the gospel of John, the word fear is found six times. And in the gospel of John, the word peace is found six times. Three times Jesus speaks his peace to the disciples right before he heads to the cross. And three times Jesus speaks his peace to the disciples. And it's in the passage we're looking at right here. The first time is in chapter 14. They're during the the last supper. It's the last evening that Jesus has with his disciples. And Jesus lets them know what he's going to leave them when he dies. It's like his last will and testament. And he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I'm going to give you not as the world gives. Do I give you let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So he was telling them, I'm going to go. And what I'm going to leave for you as a gift is I am going to leave you my peace. I'm going to give you my peace as a gift in the same discussion. Two chapters later in chapter 16, he says, I've said these things to you that in me, you may have peace in the world. You'll have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The next time he speaks peace is in this moment right here on that evening of the first day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. A couple verses later, Jesus said to them again, peace 
be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. Eight days later, the disciples are there again, and Thomas is now with them, and the doors are locked, and Jesus came again and stood among them, and what is his message? Peace be with you. Is the peace of Jesus sufficient for all of our fears? Well, in the Gospel of John, it mentions fear six times, and in the Gospel of John, it mentions peace six times. And I just want to submit to you that the peace of Jesus is a perfect match for every fear that we come across. The peace of Jesus is a perfect match. The peace of Jesus speaking in exactly as a perfect match to every fear that we face. Jesus speaks peace to us as we are experiencing fear. So wherever it is that you today are experiencing fear, I bet if I asked every person who is here, every person would give a different, unique answer of how they're experiencing fear in their life right now. It would all be customized to what you have experienced. And Jesus speaks peace to us as we experience fear. And that's exactly what we see happen to these disciples who are huddled up in a locked room. And he comes and he shows up in the midst of them. And he says, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and he showed them his side. So the resurrected body of Jesus, Jesus shows up in the resurrected body. It still has the wounds on his body from the crucifixion. And he shows up and he shows his hands and he shows his side. And when the disciples see him, they are now glad that they saw the Lord. They were in grief. They were in grief that Jesus was arrested. They were in grief that Jesus went on trial. They were in grief that he was tortured. They were in grief that he was handed over to the Roman government. They were in grief that he was beaten brutally. They were in grief that they watched their leader die, crucified on a cross. They experienced grief when he took his last breath and died. They experienced grief when they took him off the cross and he was placed in a tomb. They experienced grief. And it is the first resurrection Sunday evening, and they are in a locked room, and they are very afraid. And they go from being fearful and full of grief to now Jesus shows up in the middle of their fear and they are now glad because they're seeing the Lord because God showed up to them right where they were afraid. Where are you afraid right now? Where you need Jesus to stand among you. My oldest child He's now grown and has a family of his own. When he was just a really young boy, he got very sick. And we had to take him to the hospital. He was in the hospital for a long time. And I was a very, very young dad. And we would be down in Turlock, which is the hospital that he was at. And because we were there so long, my wife would spend the evening, spend the night at the hospital with my son in the hospital. And I would drive back up to West Modesto where we lived. And I was, each day, as I watched my son be unable to breathe, it was just crushing me as a young dad to watch my son go through that, to see that he needed machines so that he could breathe. Just a tiny little boy. And that he couldn't even breathe on his own. That he needed machines to help him breathe. And it was weighing on me and weighing on me and crushing me and crushing me. And one night, as I'm leaving Turlock late, and I'm now northbound on the 99, I am just crying out to God. And I am crying tears of pain down my face. In driving in the middle of the night, God, help my son. And an incredible peace came over my life. As I'm driving down, tears in my eyes, driving down northbound 99, coming back to West Modesto. The peace of God just 
washed over me. God's got my kid. God's got my kid. God's got this situation. God's got it. Oh, the peace of God just rushing into my life. I didn't hear a voice. There was no magic moment. Just God gave me his peace. Right in the place that I was so freaked out as a young dad. Just feeling helpless like I couldn't help my kid at all. I couldn't do anything to make it better. And God gave me his peace right where I needed it. I don't know where it is that you are experiencing great fear right now, but I believe that Jesus can speak peace right to the place where you are experiencing fear. Jesus speaks peace to us as we experience fear. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Now a second time he says, peace be with you. And I don't think it's just a second greeting being that this is a Jewish greeting. I think it's a reflection from chapter 14 when he says, my peace I live with, leave with you, my peace I give to you. So twice in the same sentence, he tells them with a double emphasis, I'm going to leave my peace to you with you and I'm going to give my peace to you. And here now he shows up in the middle of their fear and he says, peace be with you. And the next thing he says is peace be with you. I, remember guys, I told you I was going to give you my peace and I'm here and I'm giving it to you. And this time when he says, peace be with you, he says their job description. As the Father has sent me, even so, I'm sending you. When we look at the Gospels, we see in all the Gospels, there's an account of a commissioning that takes place where the disciples now have a job to do. And this is the Apostle John's version of what we might look at at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where we see the Great Commission. This is the Apostle John's version of that, of the commission that they received from the mouth of Jesus. And it comes with his peace. And you might be thinking, well, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'd ever want to go talk to anybody about Jesus. Well, we'll see how long God lets you go without you having to open up your mouth and talk about Jesus. And you might be thinking, there's no way I'll do it. I'll never say anything. Oh, there's no way I could talk to you. I would be too afraid. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. How did the Father send Jesus? Jesus said, I didn't come here to do my own will. I came to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. Jesus is telling the disciples, peace be with you. God sent me to do his will so that people would be drawn to him, to Jesus, and now I'm sending you. And now you are gonna be sent out to do God's will so that people will come to him, come to Jesus. And where you're afraid, my peace is gonna be with you. And this is a picture of how Jesus speaks peace to us as we are sent according to God's will. And God is going to send you, as a follower of Jesus, as one of his kids, he's going to send you on mission. And that might be terrifying for you to think about. But Jesus speaks his peace to us as we're sent according to God's will. The word of God says, let the peace of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. God is going to do a work in and through our lives and his peace goes with us as we are sent by God, wherever it is he's gonna send us to do his will. Verse 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This is an incredible symbolic moment that Jesus has where he exhales, he breathes on them, and then he says something, he communicates something to them. He tells them about a gift he's going to give them, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John is a treasure for us to understand about the Holy Spirit of God. There is so much content in the Gospel of John that is about the Holy Spirit of God. And when the Apostle John writes this, this is so far after the events that occurred that we read about in the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit to the church. This is so far after that. And for whatever reason, this is how 
John chooses to kind of tie a bow on this huge subject about how the Holy Spirit of God was going to be given to the disciples after Jesus dies. And he does it simply that Jesus breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Listen to some of the things that Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm gonna ask the Father, he's gonna give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, The world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me and you also will bear witness because you have been with me From the beginning, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but what he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things are to come. So Jesus had taught them extensively the Holy Spirit's coming and the Holy Spirit's gonna be at work in you. And now he says, peace be with you as the father has sent me, so I'm sending you. But remember, you're not on your own. And he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What a statement. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What is Jesus trying to communicate to the disciples about forgiveness? Well, in the gospel of John, The word forgive shows up three times. All three are in the same verse. The only place the word forgive shows up in the gospel of John is in this verse right here, and it's three times. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And when we read verses in the gospel of John and we have questions, we just need to read more of the gospel of John because our questions now will be answered. So if this is what it says about forgiveness, then we've got to come to another word. What is being forgiven? Forgiving of sin. So we need to ask the question, what does the gospel of John say about sin? In the very first chapter, when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus taught this. I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So Jesus taught that unless you believe in Jesus Christ, you die in your sins. So Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And unless you believe in Jesus, you'll die in your sin. Jesus also taught something about what the Holy Spirit would do. He said, nevertheless, I tell you, it's your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the helper, the Holy Spirit to you. And when he comes, he, the helper, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So the gospel of John teaches us that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Unless you believe in Jesus, you will die in your sins. And the Holy Spirit is going to come and convict us of our sin. That all sounds like God's doing all the work. So now come back to this first. What is Jesus saying? If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What just happened? Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. He breathes on them. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he says, this is the action that's now gonna take place in your life. God will be working in your life. The word of God will now be flowing through your life. The Holy Spirit of God is gonna be at work in your life. And when people come into contact with the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God is going to convict them of their sin. They're gonna come face to face with the conviction of their sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And people will either choose to accept the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and believe in him for the forgiveness of their sin, or they will reject Jesus. And he's letting them know, you now are a part of the communication channel that God is now gonna be working in. And God's gonna be working in your life. And people are gonna come into contact with you and they're gonna come in contact with the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God and either they're gonna experience the forgiveness of Jesus or they're not. It's all about what God's going to do. Jesus speaks peace to us as we receive the Holy Spirit's work. If you're thinking, I can't be used by God because I'm not smart enough. I can't be used by God because I'm not gifted enough. I can't be used by God because I don't know enough about the Bible. I can't be used by God because I haven't walked with God long enough. I just gotta tell you, your focus is absolutely in the wrong place because your focus is on you. It's not about you and it's not about your work. It is about what is the work that God's gonna do in your life and what is the work that God's gonna do through your life. And if that terrifies you, just know you're not alone because Jesus speaks peace to us as his peace as we receive the Holy Spirit's work into our life. He says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. He breathes on them. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. And people are gonna come into contact with the forgiveness of Jesus. And so stop focusing on yourself and allow God to work through you. Because the Holy Spirit wants to do an incredible work in your life And every excuse that you make that starts with how you are not enough is a really bad excuse because it has never been about whether you are enough or not. It's about that Jesus is enough. He's the one who made it enough. He's the one who made it sufficient. It was his work, not ours. And now he speaks his peace into our life and the Holy Spirit's gonna be at work as God sends us. In verse 24, now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And I just got to ask the question, where was Thomas? So there's 12 disciples, Judas bails. Now there's 11 disciples. And yet now we find out only 10 of them on the first resurrection Sunday evening, only 10 of them are huddled up. Yeah, are they afraid? Yes, but they're together. They're afraid together. Where is Thomas? What did he have going on that he was not with his discipleship group on week one? Like what excuse did Thomas have for why he was not at discipleship group week one? What was going on with him? And what did Thomas just miss out on because he was not with the group of disciples? Jesus just showed up. Jesus just spoke his peace into their lives. Jesus just gave them a commission. Jesus just... Gave them the spirit. Thomas wasn't there. Makes me think about, man, what do we miss when we don't show up when the family of God's getting together, when the discipleship group's meeting? What are the reasons and the excuses that we make of why we can't go be with the discipleship group? And what are we missing out on that God's doing? So the other disciples, you're not going to believe what happened, man. We've been in this room locked. We're all freaked out. We're totally afraid. And boom, Jesus stands there. He's like, check out my hands. Check out my side. And then he talks to us. He says, there's peace over us. Then he, and then he tells us he's sending us out. And, and then he like, he like breathed on us and, and he like received the Holy Spirit. And, and, then, and then now we've got like this work that has to do with forgiveness somehow that we're going to go out. And Thomas is like, what are you guys talking about? He missed the whole thing. And listen to what Thomas's response was. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. It makes me think, what reasons have we given God? God, I'm not gonna believe unless you do this, you do this, and you do this. I'm not gonna believe unless this, this, this happen. What demands do we make of God? God, you must do this first before I will do this. And why in the world would somebody want to place their finger into the mark of the nail? That sounds gross to me, to place his hand into the side of Jesus. I'm like, that's disgusting. And I don't want anything to do with it. Why would he even ask for that? This doesn't make any sense to me. 
And yet he says, unless these things happen, I'm not going to believe. Eight days later, disciples were inside again. Okay, so it's discipleship group week number two. All right. It's the second week that they're meeting. And it says Thomas was with them. All right. He made it to the second week. All right. He made it. He made it to the discipleship group. Although the doors were locked. So the doors were locked again. Jesus comes and stands in their midst. And uh, now the third time in this passage, he says, peace be with you. But this time, Thomas is there to hear it. Peace be with you. And one of the things I think is so cool about God is even though Thomas missed discipleship group on the first resurrection Sunday evening, it's the next week he's there and God still comes and meets him. Peace be with you. And it makes me think about how in our families, every person in our family has come to know the peace of Jesus Christ at a different moment. Our loved ones coming to know Jesus at a different time and a different place and how God somehow gets all of us ready. And then when we're ready, he comes and he speaks his peace into our lives. And that's the last point here is that Jesus speaks peace to us as we are made ready by God. And that to me gives me so much hope for those that I love who it doesn't appear yet they've been made ready by God yet. But man, God, maybe today's going to be the day that you make them ready and you're going to speak peace into their life. Maybe tomorrow's the day you're going to make my loved one ready and you're going to speak your peace. Maybe next week, maybe next week is when my loved one is going to come to know the peace of Jesus Christ. So Jesus then does something I don't think he has to do. I don't think Jesus needs to meet any of our demands. I don't think Jesus needs to meet any of our demands. But Jesus does something crazy. He, he says to Thomas, hey, Thomas, I, ha- I hear you have a finger. Why don't you put that finger here, Thomas? See my hands? Hey, Thomas, I heard you have a hand. Why don't you put out your hand? Place it into my side. Like, I don't think Jesus needs to do this at all. But he says it to him. And then he gives Thomas an instruction. He says, Do not disbelieve, but believe. Don't be disbelieving, but be believing. Now, what's crazy is it doesn't say Thomas puts his finger in his hand, and it doesn't say Thomas puts his hand in his side. So apparently Thomas didn't need to do it because the next thing it says is he just he just shouts it, my Lord and my God. He just shouts it out, my Lord and my God. And what's crazy is we had a guy who was absent from the discipleship group. He is unbelieving. He's demanding to God. And now we have the clearest confession of who Jesus is in the entire New Testament in the Gospels. Thomas, the guy who was just unbelieving, demanding, he now gives the clearest confession. Who is Jesus? My Lord and my God. He is saying, Elohim, Yahweh, this is God. He's looking at Jesus. You are God. How fast God can show up into somebody's life and completely transform their life. So whoever it is you're praying for, you're hoping that God's going to show up in their life and transform. It's possible. And Jesus could show up just like that, just like this in your loved one's life and totally change their life. Maybe you're here and you're like Thomas and you've been very unbelieving. And you've made lots of demands on God. And maybe God's about to show up in your life, show you his power, give his peace to you, and you will be the next person proclaiming, my Lord and my God, because your eyes are now seeing and you understand who Jesus is. So Jesus now replies, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 98 times in the gospel of John, the word believe shows up. It's kind of a big theme. 98 times in the gospel of John, the word believe shows up. And Jesus is saying, there is a blessing for those who have not seen the resurrected body of Jesus Christ, yet they believe. And that's the point of this book. That is why we have been studying this book, because what do the next two verses say? Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
When through the power of the word of God, you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your God, and you believe, you become blessed are those. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet are believing. And when every one of us right now comes to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and our God, and we believe, we become a part of the category called blessed are those. There is an incredible blessing for us as we believe in Jesus Christ. I don't know what it is that you in your life, where you are experiencing fear, but I wanna encourage you to welcome the peace of Jesus Christ into your life. Welcome it and believe in him because there's an incredible blessing waiting for you as Jesus speaks his peace into your life and you trust in Jesus and you believe in him. He's gonna take you places you never dreamed of. He's gonna do things in your life you never thought were possible. He's gonna transform you. And you could go from being absent, unbelieving, and demanding to be proclaiming that Jesus is your God and your life will be forever changed. Father God, Lord, may you be glorified in us. We love you, Lord. We know that we need to grow in our love for you. So God, would you continue to draw us to love you more and more? Thank you that Jesus Christ is our peace. God, help us to welcome the peace of Jesus into every place that we fear. And God, would we be transformed because we are a people who have been with Jesus. So Lord, we love you and we say that we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said.